Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the lead engineer at IT Pro TV. With me today is Cameron Guerra, one of the engineers on my team. Thanks for joining me today, Cam. Thanks for having me, Taylor. It's good to have you on the show. And on this show, we talk about Haskell. No surprise there. It's a purely functional programming language. But what specifically are we going to be talking about today, Cam? We're going to be talking about why Haskell. Why Haskell? What do you mean by that? Well, there was a a blog post um, by the semantic team at GitHub um, called Why Haskell and why they chose Haskell for that project, um, kind of led by Timothy Clem. So, Okay, so GitHub is using Haskell in production. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's a big secret. We're not the only company out there with, with Haskell code in product. No, there, there's some big time. Um, but before we kind of get into to their article, um, why don't we kind of start with what is Semantic and, and why maybe is Haskell good for them? Yeah, so Semantic is a, um, I guess, package or program by the GitHub team, and it's what they use to analyze and uh, compare source code on their servers. So like when you submit a pull request to GitHub, um, you may notice that in addition to like being able to break it down by file, you know, jump to this file in the diff, um, you can also jump to specific functions and say, show me the changes on this function alone. Mm -hmm. And Semantic is a tool on their back end that allows that to happen. So they can parse the source code of JavaScript or Python or whatever and figure Mm -hmm. out, oh, this is a function and something within that function changed. No, that's awesome. Um, And and why, why is this announcement big news? This is a big deal because GitHub obviously is a giant force in the development community. Mm -hmm. A lot of people use GitHub to manage their source code and they're just a huge company. So they've got lots of people working for them. And this is a big deal because Haskell is a pretty small community, especially in relation to all of GitHub, you know, right. There aren't too many companies out there using Haskell. Um, a couple of the big ones that I can think of off the top of my head are Facebook and Nike mm-hmm. and us, of course, but you know, IT Pro we're, TV we're is not huge. as big as them yet. We're coming, we're coming for you, Facebook. <laughs> IT Pro TV, the next Facebook, the IT world. <laughs> but yeah, this is, this is just a big deal because GitHub's a big company and Haskell's a small language and it, it is really interesting to a lot of people. Yeah. It's good to see the community growing, you know, and yeah, big sure. organizations picking up this language allows for the community to to obviously grow. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's so many employees at GitHub and, you know, obviously just the semantic team right now is using Haskell, but I'm sure it's spreading through their organization and kind of, uh, it's going to allow our community to continue to grow and have, you know, more experts in the field, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And that's really cool. Even if you're at a smaller company and you're interested in using Haskell, this can be really useful because you can point to GitHub and say, look, they're using it and it's working for them. It Mm -hmm. could work for us too. Right. And, um, uh, a lot of the articles out there about why people choose Haskell are are pretty normal. Like, they're pretty standard, like this, this, and this. But w- why do you think, um, you know, G- GitHub kind of chose this different path? Um, this different path to using Haskell? Right. Yeah, so for a lot of the blog posts that I've read in the past about why companies have chose Haskell, it you sort of see the same reasons trotted out. You know, Haskell is a pure language, so you don't have to worry about side effects and weird parts of your code. Mm -hmm. Or it has lazy evaluation, so you don't have to worry about things being evaluated, even if you don't end up using them. Um, Or it, you know, lets you express complicated ideas in a small amount of code. And the first time you see that set of arguments, it might be compelling, but the fifth or tenth or hundredth time (laughs) you see them, you're like, okay, I get it. I know Haskell has those things. What else can it do? Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. Yeah, and and I think it's really cool that they... um Kind of, kind of broke it down. Um, they had some different reasons for choosing Haskell. So, uh, do you kind of want to kick off, you know, what reasons they chose and, and why they chose Haskell? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, there's kind of the bog standard reasons for why people typically choose Haskell. Um, but one thing that I like about this article is they didn't dwell on that too much. They mm-hmm. said, "Yeah, these are all characteristics of Haskell. These are reasons why you might want to choose it." But um, they ended up focusing more on what come or things that are only possible because of those kind of fundamental characteristics, but right. um, more compelling reasons for their particular business case. And mm-hmm. I think the one that they start with is control flow, right? Correct. Yep. And so by control flow, what they mean is that in a typical programming language, something like Java or C Sharp or Go, um, 
the control flow is built into the language itself. So like if a statement is above another one, you know that it's gonna get executed first. So you know, mm -hmm. top to bottom, left to right, basically. And in Haskell, that's not necessarily the case. You can write code that looks the same, but one version of it might be synchronous and another version of it might be asynchronous. So, um, you know, this comes up in JavaScript all the time where the synchronous function is really easy to write, but you block the main thread for a long time. And mm -hmm. if you're doing something with a web UI, then your UI stalls while that synchronous thing is happening. Mm -hmm. So you want to write stuff in this async fashion, but then you have to do like nested callbacks or you do the async await or something like that. Right. So the syntax, you have to change the way that you write your code in order to change how the control flow works. Mm -hmm. But with Haskell, you the code that you write looks the same, but you can change how it's implemented or not implemented, but executed. Right, right, right. So pretty much high, higher up in the, in the program is where kind of the deciding factor of, oh, is this sync or this asynchronous or synchronous? Like Exactly. And you, the further you get into the code, it just looks the same. And it's not, you don't have to like be worried of, oh, am I writing this the right way? Mm -hmm. Because in the end, I want this result. Like the code you write is can be executed however you want it to be executed. You just tell that, you know, once you write, start to write the executable and make that code come true. Yeah. And that's especially useful for the semantic team because what they're doing is parsing and analyzing source code. So they want to be able to parse, let's say, a Python file and analyze it as if it was executing, but not actually execute it. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes really powerful to have, you know, all these tools that Haskell provides to be able to manage the control flow in the same way that you manage regular data in other languages. Right. Right. No, I think that's awesome. Um, so the other thing they kind of talk about and the reason they chose it was, um, runtime correctness. Um, and you know, they gave a lot of really great, you know, things we've, we've kind of experienced, but, uh, what were some of the things you took away from, you know, that, that aspect of the article? I really liked that aspect of the article and I'm glad that they brought it up because when you read about, let's say Elm, another language that's in the same vein, they bring that front and center all the time. It's like on their homepage, you mm -hmm. know, um, they say you can write programs with confidence and not have to worry about runtime errors. And I wish Haskell marketed more in that direction because it is really powerful to not have to worry about those runtime errors and trust mm -hmm. that when you write the program and it compiles, it will almost, it will generally do what you want or what you intended for it to do. Right. And you don't have to worry, oh crap, well, I forgot that this value could be null. So then you get a null pointer exception in production mm -hmm. or you forgot uh, I changed the name of that method last week and I forgot to update it here at this call site. So now I'm getting a method not found error. Right. It, it saves you from those really tedious kind of rote problems. And so that you can focus on developing new features and shipping those out to your users rather than fixing some bug that popped up in your issue tracker for the hundredth time. Yeah. One thing I wish Haskell was magical at, and it can be, we just aren't necessarily using it right now at IT Pro TV, um, is, is the kind of, a way to get away from um, accidentally like misaligning like a, a value from you know JSON or something like that because mm -hmm. um, we we've kind of you know in some of our parsing uh, for you know our JSON parsing we use the applicative stuff and that kind of uh, enters that like hey this could end up being different because you misalign you know the keys or whatever mm -hmm. um, so I I think as a, as a group of developers, I would like for us to kind of lead, lean more into, okay, let's not use applicative just so we can make sure we keep our sanity. Cause I, I mean, a few months ago I was just banging my head against the wall <laughs> trying to figure out like, wait a second, what's happening here. And, and sure enough, it was just a miss, a flip flopped key. Mm -hmm. I was like, mm. that brings up a good point that just because Haskell gets rid of a large portion of runtime errors doesn't mean that it gets rid of all of them. And in mm -hmm. fact, it's not even desirable to get rid of all of them because you'd have to pay so much up front in order to do that. But there are some things like you mentioned with the applicative syntax where they allow you to sort of accidentally introduce problems that are very hard to detect. Mm -hmm. And there are easy ways around that. In our case, doing those, or excuse me, writing those parsers in a more monadic style makes it clearer which things are going where. So you can look at a line and say, oh no, we're pulling this field that's named price, but we're pulling it from a, you know, object where the key we're looking for is name. And that obviously doesn't line up. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I do, 
I do think a lot of the things that Haskell provides for runtime correctness is, are great. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really glad that they kind of echoed that because, like you said, Elm, that's something they boast all about. Yeah. Uh, but Haskell, you don't really hear about that until you're in it and you're like, oh, like <laughs> this isn't going to let me like change a function name over here without updating all the callers. Like that's not possible. Yep. Um, because that compiler will not will not be happy with you. <laughs> um, well, that's awesome. Um, the other thing they kind of touched on was kind of the research. So academia is kind of leaning more towards Haskell as a um, a language that, you know, these new research methods are kind of written in these mm -hmm. algorithms and uh, all this various stuff. Um, you know, what is what is that useful for, for GitHub? You touched on it a little already in that a lot of computer science papers are written using Haskell or, or a language that's very close to Haskell. But, um, you know, the, that kind of typical computer science paper that you read with the, the font that everybody knows and the like two <laughs> column layout and the, all that stuff, the code that you look at in those papers is usually Haskell. And if you can take that code from an established research paper and more or less copy paste it into your library mm -hmm. and start using it right away, that's a huge win. Versus if you were using basically any other language, you would have to think, okay, how can I port this behavior that I want that they're talking about in this paper into the language that I have? And you have to change the semantics. You have to change the you know actual shape of the code itself. You have to make sure everything works the way you expected. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just more difficult to do that. Now, that's not a common problem for, you know, workaday programmers like us, you know, we're writing web apps. Right. We're not looking into research papers to figure out, well, how do we parse JSON? It's it's kind of a solved problem at this point. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, which, which is nice, but it is also helpful if you're, you know, trying to be on the cutting edge of technology and the, and the growth in technology. Mm -hmm. Like research papers have Haskell. Like that's where the code is. Like yeah. that's what it is. So and th those papers are still coming out. Programming right. language theory, not a solved field. And the semantic team at GitHub is on the cutting edge of this. You know, they are analyzing source code for millions of software projects across many different programming languages, mm -hmm. and they want to do it quickly, effectively, safely. And the research is kind of showing them how to do that, and they're able to crib from it effectively. No, and I think that's really awesome. So I definitely applaud them for. Oh yeah, um, me too. Th this article. Um, they also kind of talked about you know the things they didn't like, which is a helpful thing. Um, when you're analyzing, okay, do I jump in and go with Haskell or do mm -hmm. I, you know, lean towards, you know, the Java or C Sharp or something, you know, a little more mainstream? Like, yeah. I always like it when I see an article like this and they include the stuff they didn't like. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's really easy to look at it and discount it offhand and think, well, they just really like this and it's their pet language and they want it to succeed. So they're not going to say anything bad about it. Is it their cat language or their dog <laughs> or language? Cat or dog. Are they cat or dog people, do you think? Maybe fish. They could be fish people. Fish people. Lizard people. They're Aquaman. <laughs> All right. Anywho, uh, no, that, I think that's, um, you know, it does add credibility to, to this doc, uh, document or blog post. <laughs> yeah. This article. A very, I'm very official article. Yeah. <laughs> article is a good term. I should use that more often, but, uh, they, they talk about, um, kind of the weak tooling aspect. This is something we've, um, come, come to deal with yeah um, it's a problem we've definitely run into right and, and so do you want to kind of explain what we do to kind of counteract this and sure acknowledge it first just kind of for a statement of terms i think that when they talk about tooling they're talking about like an ide integration something mm -hmm. like intellij or visual studio where when you're working on code you can mouse over a certain part and it'll show you perhaps the documentation for that thing or what parameters it expects or where in your code base it's used, you know, mm -hmm. um, stuff that isn't earth shattering on its own, but a bunch of small niceties that add up to a really positive experience. Mm -hmm. And they're right to say that Haskell is kind of weak in this regard. There are certainly tools that help. The one that we use most often is GHC ID. Yeah. Another one I wish to, another one that I was just thinking about offhand, sorry to cut you off on this, but uh, Intero. Yeah, Intero offers like the awesome IDE experience, but it like takes over people's machines and like <laughs> crashes them. Like, Yeah, and uh, we've run into problems with Haskell IDE engine where the promise of it is excellent, but when you run it for more than a couple hours, it starts eating up all the RAM it can find. Mm -hmm. So it's hungry. 
I think that Haskell is moving in the right direction and they seem to have landed on the same solution as us, which is you have your editor up on maybe the left-hand side of your screen and your compiler output up on the right-hand side and you kind of stitch things together yourself. Mm -hmm. Obviously not ideal, but definitely workable. Yeah. And just to kind of color that a bit, from my point of view, I think this comes down mostly to lack of resources because developing all of that tooling just takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And for these other languages like Java or JavaScript, you have millions of people working in these languages. And that's not true for Haskell. So I'm excited to see GitHub talk about this because if they get people interested and excited about Haskell and working in it, then the tooling is naturally going to improve as more people get in with the community. No, I think that's a very good point. So way to go, GitHub. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, they also kind of talk about um, no dependent types. Um, why do you think this is an issue for them? So we already talked a little how they kind of borrow from current programming language research and apply it to their problem domain. So they're already in a kind of unusual situation as far as that goes. And I think that's why they feel this pain from the lack of dependent typing because they're pushing Haskell's type system to its limits. And Haskell, while it's well revered for having a strong, useful type system, it does not have dependent types. And there's lots of things you can do to try to pretend like you have them or give you some of the same benefits of dependent types. But at the end of the day, it doesn't happen. And I can't speak personally to this because I haven't run into this particular limitation in the type of development mm -hmm. that we do. And I think that most developers would not run into this problem. You know, they wouldn't think, oh, well, I wish I had dependent types here. It doesn't, it doesn't come up that often. Mm -hmm. But for them, it does. I don't want to discount their experience here. Obviously, they wish they had this and they don't. So the you know the only languages that do have this they're they're few and far between stuff like agda and idris um they have this but they're they're a little less production ready than haskell is they're not used quite as widely right hmm. that's interesting um yeah i don't think we've really like thought of dependent types has never really been a, a thing mm -hmm. i um, think that you know it's a great idea and i'm really interested in it but day to day there's not too much where i'm like oh this would be so much easier if i had dependent types yeah Drats. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, they also kind of talk about um, kind of the, the lack of infra glue. Yeah, I like that terminology they used, infra glue. Infra -glue. It sounds like a, something you'd buy from a TV channel or something. <laughs> right here. Here's your infra glue. <laughs> glue. Wow, I can't even talk. Um, but yeah, so they mentioned that for the actual meat and potatoes of their program, Haskell does a great job. But for the stuff where they have to worry about like deploying or making containers or stuff like that, um, it's a little more difficult and that's mostly because it's similar to the tooling problem where just not as many people have been using it. So there's mm -hmm. not a canned solution for like, Oh, I want to deploy this to AWS or I want to make a container out of this. You can definitely do those things, but you're probably going to have to do them yourself rather than just picking something off the shelf that says, okay, yeah, I'll deploy this Python program to Heroku or whatever. Right. It's a little more boilerplate. Yeah. And, and again, not, a showstopper and not terribly difficult to get around, but just annoying that it's not there. Yeah, um, no, that's fair. But uh, the one of the more interesting ones that I feel like we've encountered a lot is um, the the kind of the performance issues with lazy evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, I think for us, we've had various scripts and you know things as you know our code is trying to figure out what it's going to do until it actually needs to execute something. It just builds up this giant thunk that you know hangs out all over the place and then you're like <laughs> everything slows down and you're like what's going on mm -hmm. um and then you put one exclamation point in one place and everything works again -da! Like that. <laughs> yeah and you know we, we've they kind of talked about the language extension um strict data strict data i was like yeah static data no strict data <laughs> yeah um and so that's how they kind of i guess counteracted it but mm -hmm. why do you think for them that's a big issue i think that lazy evaluation is a double-edged sword in haskell for sure and the main reason for that is that Haskell is pretty much the only programming language that I can think of off the top of my head that is lazy by default. Every other programming language is strict by default. Mm -hmm. So as programmers, we're not used to identifying and solving problems that stem from laziness because we rarely encounter them. Mm -hmm. In other languages, you have to explicitly opt in. So like in Python, you can make a generator or in JavaScript, you do all the async stuff to, to pretend like you have laziness. Whereas in Haskell, it's everywhere. So um, people just aren't used to looking for those types of problems. And so they're mm -hmm. bound to crop up every now and then. That being said, 
they're usually not terribly hard to diagnose and fix once you have a couple tricks in your bag. But the first time that you run into them, they can be completely mystifying because you can look at code and it looks totally reasonable. But um, for whatever reason, the way that you wrote it either, you know, generates too much, um, too many thunks, like you mentioned, and mm -hmm. you don't evaluate them at the right time or, or just something like that. And, and it can be really difficult to figure out what's going on. And, and again, this comes back to the lack of tooling. If there was better tooling to um, analyze the laziness of your program, this would be an easier problem to solve. Hmm. So maybe with time, get up, maybe with time. Mm -hmm. um, all right. The last one, um, this one hits home for us, is they kind of said, <clears throat> you know, it's got a notorious reputation of being too hard to learn. Mm -hmm. um, as, you know, a bunch of junior developers for the most part, m minus you and Cody, um, you know, learning Haskell in, within the last two years, you know, like it's it had its like a little bit of growing pain in the beginning, but once you understand like the concept and the paradigm of functional programming, it becomes a lot more attainable um, yeah. to, to really conquer the language and, you know, have a good understanding of it without, you know, maybe not the deepest understanding, but you can have a general idea of what's going on. So um, that, what, what do they have to say about that? I think they say something very similar to what we think and I hope have said, but if we haven't yet, we'll say it now that, um, Haskell's does have this reputation of being difficult to learn, but it's not that difficult. And it's especially not that difficult to get to a working knowledge where mm -hmm. maybe you don't have a super deep understanding of everything that's going on, but you can get work done and you can feel effective and be effective without knowing you don't, you don't have to learn category theory or really like understand what is a monad in order to program in Haskell day to day. Mm -hmm. And they say, especially with, um, some type of, you know, mentor or tutor on the team, you can get people up to speed really quickly. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that we hired somebody a month ago and they got up to speed basically within the first week. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, they obviously don't understand all of Haskell, everything. I mean, it's a huge language. There's a lot to know, right? But they know enough to be effective and write code that works and submit it for PR and get it, you know, into production within a week or two of being hired. It's, right. it's not insurmountable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I think another attribute for us, um, a tribute to like the ability to learn Haskell has been like the idea of promiscuous pairing, which um, for those of those of you listeners, you guys check it out. Um, <laughs> there's a cool paper on it. So uh, we've been doing it for a little while now and we find it very effective um, and it allows us knowledge transfer really well. So, um, you know, I did a shameless plug for Jason. <laughs> he's, uh, he's all yeah, about it. He's all about it. And it really ties into what get this semantic team at GitHub said of, you know, having a tutor, somebody who knows the ropes to show the new person, promiscuous pairing just forces that every right. time around. Everyone must be a learner. <laughs> the teacher. I'm whispering. I'm whispering into a microphone. That's kind of weird. <laughs> um, all right. And, and obviously, this program is pretty large semantic, like as far as like yeah. the depth of what it can do. But it's only 20,000 lines of code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's amazing because as they point out several times in their article, if they had written this in let's say Java, they may have written 20,000 lines of just boilerplate, whereas mm. the entire Haskell program would fit into that same space. Um, so yeah, it, it's phenomenal that they can get so much done with so little code. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just incredible. So I, I, I do think this is um, you know, a really great article and I would definitely encourage all of our listeners to check it out. For sure. Um, but do you have anything else you, you'd like to add on it? I don't think so. Um, just want to reiterate that uh, it's great to see another big company like GitHub using Haskell in production and generally coming away with a positive experience. Obviously, they had some things that they didn't like too much, but overall, they were really positive about it. And it seems like if they had to choose it again, they would. Yeah, we'll see the Octocat soon with uh, yeah. some sweet uh, Haskell tattoos. Yeah, the purely functional Octocat. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. Well, Taylor, it's been really, really fun talking. Um, it's been great talking with you, Cam. Thanks for being on the show with me. Of course, always, anytime. And thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. Uh, this has been episode number 13. If you liked what you heard, find out more at our website, haskellweekly.news. Also, please take a minute to rate and review us on iTunes. It helps us out a lot. I think right now Cameron and I are the only people that have reviewed us. So See Sizzle yeah. out there, <laughs> reviewed. Um. This episode, like all of the other ones we've done so far, was actually recorded in our own office, the IT Pro TV studios. So I just want to give a shout out to IT Pro for recording this whole thing. Woohoo! 
Um, and it, IT Pro, what we do is provide IT training that's both effective and entertaining. So if that sounds interesting to you, please go find out more at itpro.tv. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Adios. Adios.